Okay, so um, this video is going to cover three topics from uh, chapter 17. We're going to look at an alternative method for balancing oxidation and reduction reactions using tabulated um, half reactions that have been pre-balanced. We're going to give a description of uh, what a galvanic cell is, and then we're going to look at how we can use standard reduction potentials to calculate what is known as the overall cell potential. So we previously saw in class how to um, balance oxidation reduction reactions using the um, half reaction method, which can take up to eight steps if it is in base. But there's um, a useful appendix, Appendix L in the back of your book, that already has some pre-balanced um, half reactions, and we're going to learn how we can use those as an alternative way of balancing redox reactions. So. We know how to assign oxidation numbers to um, atoms that are present in compounds or even as elements themselves, and we can define oxidation as an increase in oxidation number, and reduction is defined as a decrease in oxidation number. So here are two um, balanced um, half reactions, and what we can see is in the oxidation half reaction given here, the oxidation number of the magnesium increases from 0 up to 2, whereas in the reduction half reaction that's given, the oxidation number of oxygen decreases from 0 down to minus 2. In the back of your book in Appendix L, there are a whole series of common half reactions. And um, this is a different table from the one that you have, uh, but it illustrates the same um, information. So you have your half reaction here, and then over here it has this thing called the standard reduction potential that we're going to talk about later. You can see that some of these half reactions are under acidic conditions, whereas others are under basic conditions. So you always want to be certain that when you're choosing one of these um, half reactions that you match the acid-base conditions of your particular system. What you will also see is that every half reaction is written in the reduction direction, so electrons are being gained in every case. If you would like an oxidation half reaction, you will have to flip one of the tabulated half reactions. So we can take two of these balanced half reactions and combine them to get the net ionic equation for a redox process as an alternative to going through the eight-step mechanism that we uh, method that we described previously. So you have to be aware of what's being oxidized and what's being reduced, and it takes a little bit of kind of mental gymnastics to um, to work through this process but I would argue that in many cases it can be easier than doing it the long way around. So here's the example. It says write the net ionic equation describing the oxidation of sodium by Cl2. So we have to think what is being oxidized and what is being reduced. So sodium is being oxidized, oxidation of sodium, so that by default means that chlorine is being reduced. So we're going to find the half reaction where chlorine is being reduced. So we look in our table and we find this guy here. <clears throat> One molecule of chlorine gains two electrons to form two moles of chloride ions. So the next part of the process is a little bit more complex because we want to look at the, the half reaction for the oxidation of sodium. So what we have to identify is the reduction that has sodium as a product. So we want to find this guy, uh, the, the um, half reaction that has sodium metal, sodium solid, as a product, and then we're going to flip that guy. So I look in my appendix and I find the reduction half reaction that has sodium solid as a product, and I change its direction. And here I am here. So now I have my two balanced half reactions. So at this point, I just need to adjust one or perhaps both so that the number of electrons lost equals the number of electrons gained. And in this case, that's fairly straightforward. I'm just going to be multiplying my oxidation half reaction by two. 
So what I've done here is I've left my reduction half reaction alone and then I've multiplied my oxidation half reaction by 2, doubling everything, and so that when I add these guys together, my electrons will cancel. Okay, so here's a more um, complicated example, and you can really see the advantage of this method um, over our previously described method. So what we're doing is, it says write the net ionic equation describing the oxidation of nitrite ion 2 nitrate ion by oxygen. So what this is really saying is that NO2 minus this guy here is getting oxidized which means by default that O2 is getting reduced. This is also going to happen in basic solution. So this would have been a real beast um, to balance uh, the long way. So finding the reduction half reaction is going to be fairly simple. I just identify the, the appropriate reaction in the tables. And I make certain that it's under basic conditions. And now I need to find the reduction that has NO2 minus as a product and then flip it. So I'm looking for the reaction that has this guy as the product, this as a reactant, and then I'm going to flip it. And that happens to be that one. So I'm not quite done yet because I have to make certain that the number of electrons that are gained equals the number of electrons that are lost. So you can see that I'm going to need to multiply my oxidation reaction by a factor of 2. So there I go ahead and do that, and now I'm ready to add these together and cancel where I can. So I can see that I'm going to eliminate my hydroxide ions, I'm also going to eliminate my water here, and very important is all of my electrons will cancel. So here I am with my overall balanced redox reaction in base. So that kind of just speeds things up a little bit if we can learn to use these pre-balanced um, half reactions. Okay, so what we've reviewed is that redox reactions involve the transfer of electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons, a reduction is gain of electrons. By using oxidation numbers, we can keep track of how many electrons are being transferred and what reactant is losing electrons and what reactant is gaining electrons. There are a variety of ways of balancing oxidation reduction reactions. We learned an eight-step method, um, but this can be a, sh a shortcut to this method is to use tabulated pre-balanced half reactions which we combine together to form um, the overall reaction describing a redox process. Okay, so the second topic that I'm going to talk about in this video is a description of what is referred to as a galvanic cell. So to begin with, I'm just going to talk about electrochemical cells in a general sense. So if we couple an oxidation half reaction by what is referred to as an external circuit to a reduction half reaction, we form what is known as an electrochemical cell. So what we're going to have are two separate compartments, one in which the oxidation half reaction is occurring, another in which the reduction half reaction is occurring, and then these are going to be electrically connected so that um, um, charge can flow through from one cell to the other. So at the oxidation half cell, um, in the oxidation compartment, we will be these will be losing electrons, and at the reduction um, compartment, we will be gaining electrons. So electrochemical cells are generally classified in one of two ways. There's what we call vol voltaic cells, and these cells have the characteristic that the overall cell reaction is spontaneous. That is, delta G is negative. So as soon as we connect up the um, external circuit for these cells, um, electrons will start moving from the oxidation compartment into the reduction compartment. These cells are very commonly referred to as galvanic cells. 
These are exa an example of these types of cells are what, are what are commonly referred to as batteries. The other type of electrochemical cell is called an electrolytic cell. And in these kinds of cells, the overall cell reaction is non-spontaneous. That is that delta G is positive. And in order for the reaction to occur for these types of cells, you actually have to continually input electrical energy. And a good example of one of these kinds of cells is the process of electroplating. If I want to gold plate a metal object, I'm going to have to continually input energy in order to make that process occur. So regardless of the type of cell, uh, both cells contain what we call two, what are called electrodes, and there will be two of them. And these um, electrodes conduct um, electricity or electrons between the surroundings, that is the external circuit, and the cell compartments. So the electrode at which the oxidation half reaction is occurring is called the anode. So it's important to remember that oxidation always occurs at the anode, and it's through this electrode that electrons leave the, um, the cell compartment. The electrode at which, reduction, at which the reduction half reaction occurs is called the cathode, and electrons enter the um, reaction compartment um, at the cathode. So anode is where oxidation occurs, cathode compartment is where reduction occurs. These electrodes must be immersed in a um, conducting mixture of ions. Most commonly, this is an aqueous solution. This mixture of ions is referred to as is called an electrolyte. It's an electrically conducting solution. In a voltaic or galvanic cell, there is a spontaneous movement of electrons through a wire from the anode to the cathode. So electrons will just move as soon as this is connected up from the anode into the cathode. So a little bit of kind of uh, labeling becomes important here. In a voltaic cell, the anode has an excess of electrons and it wants to lose them. It has an excess of negative charge compared to the cathode, which wants to gain some electrons. Therefore, the anode by convention is labeled as the negative electrode in a um, galvanic cell and the cathode is labeled as the positive electrode. You'll also see on the bottom of the diagram of the cell, there is a second connection between the two compartments. This is called the salt bridge, and what it does is it serves to complete the circuit. Anions will move from the salt bridge into the anode half cell to counter the loss of negative charge in the form of the electrons. And similarly, um, cations, cations will flow from the salt bridge into the cathode compartment to counter the gain of the um, negative electrons. Now, if we don't have the salt bridge present, then charge will build up in each of the compartments and um, electrons won't flow. So in the lab, um, generally what we'll use as a salt bridge is just a piece of filter paper and we'll wet it with a salt solution like a sodium chloride solution or something like that. So looking at a little, sort of continuing to label our um, diagram, what we've got are our two compartments. They are connected via one electrode to the other electrode with a wire. And it's through this wire that electrons flow. And they are also connected to each other via a salt bridge. And um, at the anode, electrons will be lost. And anions will move from the salt bridge into the anode compartment. At the cathode, electrons will be gained, reduction will occur, and um, to counter this gain of negative charge, cations will flow from the salt bridge into the cathode compartment. The anode is labelled as the negative electrode, as it has an excess of electrons, and the cathode is labelled as the positive electrode because it has a deficiency of electrons. By convention, we always draw electrochemical cells with the anode on the left and the cathode on the right, and then that way electrons are flowing left to right.
<clears throat> in some cases, the electrodes themselves are reactants. These types of um, electrodes are known as active electrodes. In order for this to kind of um, be the case, then the reactant has to be sort of composed of a material to which we can attach a wire that we can actually connect it to the external circuit. In other cases, the electrodes are made of chemically inert but electrically conducting material. So, and examples of this would be platinum electrodes or graphite electrodes. These are known as inert or inactive electrodes. We will often use inactive electrodes when um, the reactant is not a material that we could attach a, um, a wire to, so or it can't be moulded into a um, electrode. So, for example, when the reactant is a gas or a liquid, it's really hard to solder a wire to a gas. I've tried; it doesn't really work very well. So. A, common um, voltaic cell that you're going to see again and again and again when we start doing some homework problems is the copper zinc um, cell. So um, what we've got here is we have a zinc electrode acting as the anode, it's just a piece of zinc, immersed in an electrolyte, so a solution containing a bunch of ions, and electrons move out of the zinc electrode into the cathode compartment and the cathode electrode is a piece of copper that is immersed in an electrolyte containing copper 2 plus ions. What's going to happen is the zinc will get oxidized and the copper 2 plus ions will get reduced. Anions will flow from the salt bridge into the anode compartment cations will flow from the salt bridge into the cathode compartment. At the anode, the zinc is oxidized to zinc 2 plus. So this is interesting. What's going to happen is solid zinc is going to get turned into aqueous zinc 2 plus ions. So the anode will get eaten away. <clears throat> At the cathode, copper 2 plus ions are reduced to copper solid. This is a two electron process. So what's going to happen here is um, copper two plus ions, which are blue in color, will be converted to solid copper. And the solid copper will plate out onto the electrode surface. So what we'll see is that the cathode will actually get bigger. And we'll also see a loss of the blue color in the solution. So it'll get lighter in color. So adding these two half reactions together is fairly simple because they both involve two electrons. So the overall reaction is copper 2 plus plus zinc solid gives copper solid and zinc AQ. And when you hook this guy up, it's really cool. You'll see that the zinc electrode will slowly get consumed. You'll see a fading of the blue color due to the copper 2 plus ions. And you'll see the copper electrode, the cathode, will start getting bigger and bigger. <clears throat> so here is a sort of completely labeled diagram. The anode is on the left here. It's labeled um, as being the negative electrode. We've got a diagram of our anode compartment. The electrolyte, it doesn't matter what ions it contains because they're not involved in the chemical reaction. We've got a zinc electrode that's labeled. We've got a wire forming the external circuit through which the electrons move from the anode into the cathode. The cathode is labeled as being the positive electrode. And then we've got an, electron, uh, an electrode here that's made out of a piece of copper. We've labeled that. And that electrode is immersed in a solution containing copper 2 plus ions. And then we've got a salt bridge at the bottom here. Anions are going to move from the salt bridge into the anode. Cations will move from the salt bridge into the cathode. And then under each um, half cell, under each compartment, we've written the reaction that is occurring. So what you see pretty quickly is that to write one of these diagrams, to draw one of these diagrams for every every cell that we can conceive of is a lot of work. You know, this is not a convenient way of describing a voltaic cell. So we've developed a shorthand notation, which is a lot simpler to deal with. So in the notation for um, a voltaic cell, what we do is we write the components of the anode compartment on the left, 
in the order that they appear in the oxidation half reaction. And every time there's a phase boundary, we put a vertical line. By convention, we put the electrode um, furthest to the left. And then what we do is we put a double vertical line and then we begin to write the components of the cathode compartment. So the components of the cathode compartment are written on the right of the, um, the double line in the order that they appear in the, um, in the reduction reaction. It says oxidation reaction there in the reduction reaction. And again, we use a single vertical line every time there is a phase boundary and we always end with the electrode. If you happen to have multiple components in the same phase, um, then what you will do is you will write those components in the order that they appear in the half reaction separated by commas. So here's a good example of that at the bottom here. Our anode compart um, compartment has a graphite electrode that is immersed in a solution containing um, iodide ions and then that's in contact with solid I2. Okay, then we have a double vertical line and we have a whole bunch of stuff that is in the cathode compartment that is dissolved in aqueous solution and the cathode compartment has a graphite electrode. So that's a pretty sort of like, after a while you kind of get used to reading these and you can just um, imagine in your mind what the um, construction of the cell actually looks like. So if we separate out the two half reactions and put them in their own individual containers separated by a wire and a salt bridge then we get an electrochemical cell. If the cell if the reaction occurs spontaneously once the cell is assembled then we refer to that cell as being a voltaic cell or a galvanic cell. In any electrochemical cell oxidation always occurs at the anode and reduction always occurs at the cathode. If the reaction is spontaneous, i.e. that is if it is a galvanic cell, the anode is labelled as being the negative electrode and the cathode is labelled as being the positive electrode. We should be able to draw a diagram of a cell and um, identify all of the components, but we should also be able to use the cell notation to describe the components of a galvanic cell. So the final topic that I'm going to talk about in this video is how we can use standard reduction potentials. So in Appendix L, in the back of your book, there's, a there's this list of half reactions. They're in a sort of alphabetical order of the components. And um, you'll see at the end of that table are these E0 values. And the important thing for you to recognize is the more positive the E0 value, the standard reduction potential is, the more likely that that reduction half reaction occurs. Now it's really useful to have a table that looks more like the one that I've put in the slides here when you're answering homework problems where the standard reduction potentials are listed in decreasing order because what we're really saying is this is the most reactive, this is the thing that most wants to be reduced and least wants to be oxidized whereas at the bottom here we have the thing that least wants to be reduced and most wants to be oxidized and that can be really helpful. If you reverse a half reaction all you do is reverse the sign of its electrode potential. So here's the reduction of the lithium plus ion to form lithium solid and the reduction potential for this is minus 3.05 volts. It really doesn't want this reaction to occur. If I wanted the um, electrode potential for the oxidation of lithium solid to give the lithium plus ion, <clears throat> all I would need to do is to reverse the sign for the reduction reaction. Now what you need to be aware of is that the electrode potentials that you're provided with are always going to be reported for the reduction 
direction of the half reaction. So we're never actually going to um, be seeing oxidation potentials. Any information that's given to you is always going to be a reduction potential. So whenever you see an E0, you have to interpret it as being the E0 for the reduction. <clears throat> When you combine half um, equations to obtain an overall cell reaction, all you have to do is add together the potentials of each electrode. So here's a, um, um, here's a description of a redox process in which fluorine is being reduced to fluoride and lithium is being oxidized to lithium plus. So I can find the reduction potential for the first reaction in tables. And then I found the reduction potential for the um, reduction of lithium plus to form a lithium solid. And I flip the sign and that turns out to be 3.05 volts. So now when I add these guys together to get the overall cell potential, I just add together my two electrode potentials and this gives me a value of 5.92 volts. It's important to recognize that reduction potential is an intensive property. It doesn't depend on the, um, the amount of reactants, only on the identity of the reactants and this might be a familiar idea to you. Um, any battery that's in an automobile, whether it's a small truck or a tiny compact car, is rated as being 12 volts. And the reason for that is because they are all based on the same chemical reaction. They're all um, what we call lead acid batteries. So independent of the size of the battery, it always puts out 12 volts. So it's important to recognize that you're going to be using tabulated values of standard reduction potentials. So the overall cell potential will be equal to the standard reduction potential of your cathode minus the standard reduction potential of your anode. So um, this takes into account that we would need to flip the sign on uh, for this process. So you don't need to flip anything, you just need to find the standard reduction of each, um, of each half reaction and then subtract the um, standard reduction potential of the anode from that of the cathode. So these are referred to as standard reduction potentials and you can tell that because there's a little degree sign there which indicates that they're determined um, under standard conditions, which is one mole per litre solutions, one atmosphere for gases, the temperature is 298K, and um, any solids or liquids are entirely pure. If a cell is um, spontaneous, its cell potential will be positive, or you can also say that the standard reduction potential of the cathode will be greater than the standard reduction potential of the anode. So there are some questions where you're asked to comment on whether a process will be spontaneous or not and you're going to use that little bit of information to determine that. So let's go back to our uh, copper zinc cell and this question is asking you to calculate the cell potential for a voltaic cell comprising a copper 2 plus copper solid electrode and a zinc 2 plus zinc solid electrode. So this is my cathode because the copper is being reduced and this is my anode because the um, zinc is going to be oxidized. All right, so um, what I'm going to need to do is I need to write my um, reduction half reactions in each case. So copper 2 plus getting reduced to copper solid and then I find the standard reduction potential for that. That's my cathode. And then zinc 2 plus being reduced to zinc solid. And I find the standard reduction potential for that. And that's my anode. So this is what's going to happen. The copper, is going to, the copper 2 plus gets reduced. The zinc gets oxidized. There's two electrons being lost and two electrons, sorry, two electrons being gained and two electrons being lost. So when we add those guys together, the electrons are going to cancel out. 
what is my overall cell potential? It's the standard reduction potential of my cathode minus the standard reduction potential of my anode and it's about 1.1 volt. And this cell actually works pretty good. I've built this cell many, many times, and many of my um, students have built this, and it always kind of ends up being about 1.1 volts. So <clears throat> what's going to happen? Let's have a look at this cell. Here we've got our anode compartment. Here we've got our cathode compartment. Electrons are going to spontaneously move from the anode into the cathode and if we put a voltmeter in the middle of our wire here it would read 1.104 volts. Here I've described the cell using cell notation. This is what's happening at the anode, this is what's happening at the cathode, and so um, yeah this is kind of you know everything that we would be um, expecting to be able to do in describing this cell. So zinc, you can see, really doesn't want to get reduced. It has a very, very low um, reduction potential. It much prefers to get oxidized. Zinc is very easily oxidized. And so for this reason, um, what people will often do is they'll attach hunks of zinc to stuff um, and then it will become um, oxidized rather than the um, object that it's attached to. So if I've got a nice expensive um, boat propeller that I don't want to um, you know, have rust away, what I'll do is um, I'll attach one of these what's called zinc anodes or, <coughs> or zinc sacrificial anodes to my propeller shaft and that will get um, eaten away instead of um, the expensive propeller. Also on things like bridges and pylons and stuff that are kind of sitting in the water that we really, really don't want to rust away, they'll, um, people will attach big old hunks of um, zinc to them. They're described as being zinc anodes and um, that um, those pieces of zinc can be periodically replaced rather than having your whole bridge uh, rust away. Okay, so that brings us to an end of this video. Um, and um, just kind of summarizing what we learned about standard reduction potentials. The half reactions that are occurring in an electrochemical cell are characterized by their standard reduction potential. The more positive a standard reduction potential is, the more likely that that reaction will occur. The overall potential of a cell is given by the standard reduction potential of your cathode Sub, um, minus the standard reduction potential of your anode. If these, um, your electrochemical uh, process is spontaneous, the overall cell potential will be positive and the standard reduction potential of your cathode will be greater than that of the anode.